Good afternoon. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes to load in and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, we obviously have a very timely uh, presentation today from folks who are on the ground as well as moderated by our very own Dean Gary Bledsoe, who's going to uh, uh, and spend a lot of time making sure that what you're hearing today and what you're seeing today is worth the time that they put into it and worth, the, worth your time this morning. Um, I'll give it about two more minutes, and then we have a short presentation, three minutes only, from Sri Kulkarni, our uh, Democratic congressional candidate uh, from out in Fort Bend County. Um, and I'll go ahead, uh, Harold, are we uh, still clicking in? Let's go ahead, Harold, and go ahead and start with that, please. Thank you, and we'll be back, and I'll introduce our panel and get going. Hi. I'm Sri Preston Kulkarni, and I am honored to once again be your Democratic nominee for U.S. Congress in Texas's 22nd district, which is now ranked the number three most likely to flip red to blue district in the country. Many of you know that before I was running for Congress, I was a U.S. Foreign Service officer serving overseas for over 14 years in places like Iraq and Russia. And what I saw during my time overseas was power without accountability erodes the fundamental institutions of a society. The things that we fought for overseas, like women's rights, religious freedom, rule of law, are all under threat right here at home. That's why I resigned from the Foreign Service, because when your country's values are being threatened, the most patriotic thing to do is to fight for them. And we know what the stakes are. We know what's on the other side. In our race, the Republican nominee is a fired cop who was terminated for misconduct, including destroying evidence, who has used his power to go after and arrest a woman for simply having an anti-Trump bumper sticker. He supported sending the military into our cities in order to suppress peaceful protests, to suppress the expression of our First Amendment rights. And he called a mass order during a pandemic un-American, compared it to a communist dictatorship, even while Texas Republicans are suing right now to take health care away from millions of Americans. But we also know that we are winning. Because of you, we are the number two Democratic challenger in the country by fundraising and the number three overall most likely to flip red to blue in America this year. Because of you, we were able to almost beat Pete Olson in 2018 and push him into dropping out of the race, turning this into an open seat and a toss-up race, according to all of the ratings agencies. Most importantly, because of you, Texas is now officially the largest battleground state in the country. And Texas 22 is the largest district in America by population. We have a historic opportunity right now to turn Texas blue, to flip the three state rep seats within our district, take control of the Texas legislature, and make sure that our state and our country stand up for democratic values and for rule of law once again. We have 75 days until the most consequential election of the last century. Let's go get her done, y'all. Thank you, Harold. Uh, most y'all have already, well, actually, I, I, I can guarantee all y'all have heard at least a little bit about what's going on in front of the Portland Federal Courthouse. Um, what you're gonna learn today is there are some bigger issues in play uh, particularly what I was impressed with when Dean Bledsoe was spending time with this panel yesterday about the, the broader, not just what's happening on the street to people, but what's happening to our constitutional system, what's happening to our rule of law, what's happening to the way policing is done and who is doing it, that are really important for all of us to hear now. Um, Y'all, I, I, I absolutely would expect that everybody here listening knows and recognizes Dean Gary Bledsoe, the longtime president of the Texas NAACP, former dean at TSU, a distinguished civil rights lawyer for a long time here in Texas who's fought for ensuring, for example, the Texas Rangers have uh, diversity in every respect. He's also our 2020 um, Clarence Darrow Award recipient. And stay tuned, we're working on trying to do a hybrid event late in October, potentially at the patio, consistent with all the safety measures. Um, we're not gonna try and emulate the, the Texas Republican Party and do it without mask in person with 6,000 people, but we're gonna see if we can make something that'll, that'll bring home for all of us uh, to honor Dean Bledsoe. 
We also have Warren Benford, a professor who you all may remember came down and spoke with us uh, in September about the Flores case and what's going on at the border and the detention of children. She's got all kinds of different angles and her daughter, uh, Eddie, is also going to be joining us shortly. She's actually the reporter that was featured in the Washington Post and has been up oh, there. She is, uh, has been uh, on the ground and is going to share with us what she's seen, what she's reported. She's actually had her, even though she's a high school senior reporting for a paper, she's actually been carried by the independent. All kinds of different global media have taken advantage of what she's capturing on the ground. Uh, and then finally, David Sugarman, who, here's my Portland Timbers t-shirt, was my local counsel in a, in a case tried for about four and a half weeks against KBR in that exact courthouse. Uh, he's also someone who has not only served on the Board of Public Justice, but has also been on the front lines of civil rights litigation in Oregon in the past. Thank you very much, Dean, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Mike, thank you so much, and I want to thank the uh, uh, CLE committee for coming up with our, what I think is a really timely uh, subject, because I know we're all concerned about what will be occurring this year around the nation. There is a, a real concern that what we've seen in Portland uh, might end up being uh, something that we see in other jurisdictions, and so I think we all have to be on the alarm for that and we have to be concerned about what the true facts really are uh, so we'll really understand what's exactly um, actually unfolded there uh, in Portland. Uh, I know what we wanted to do today is our our courageous young guest uh, Eddie Benford Ross has uh, been out there uh, very uh, active and involved and in the middle of all these uh, matters uh, there in Portland and she has done uh, a great job of taking video, uh, et cetera, so that we can actually see some real live footage from someone who's there and can explain that footage to us. So we thought that would help really illuminate uh, the topic. So I think we're all wired up if we're not to start out with that video. So before we bring her on, let's start out with the video. What you're seeing there all is that Eddie started to cover the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in May when the protests first erupted. She started to cover these protests in our hometown of Salem, which is the capital of Oregon. For the next month and a half, she continued to cover those protests on a regular basis. The first few nights we did have local Salem police who were using some tear gas and uh, engaging in paramilitary tactics, but with uh, condemnation of the Salem community, they stopped doing that almost immediately. And the protests continued in a peaceful way for the next month and a half. In the meanwhile, she started to go up to Portland to compare what the, what the uh, protests looked like up there. And after the feds uh, started to take over downtown Portland, she moved her reporting on an almost nightly basis to the peaceful protests in Portland, which were followed by paramilitary tactics by the, by the federal agents. Uh, during that time, she has regularly witnessed widespread violence indiscriminately against the uh, organizers and against the participants, even a city council member uh, who was organizing the protests the first night that she was up there after the feds arrived. And uh, Eddie witnessed that group being tear gassed by the feds without provocation. As the time went on, she saw more and more aggressive tactics. <laughs> Uh, consistent with shock and awe campaigns. And despite those tactics, she continued to witness more and more people showing up and protesting both in favor of ending racism in America, police brutality, as well as the federal presence and, and aggression here in Portland. So these are a sample of videos and pictures that you're gonna see. Um, <laughs>
Mike, do you want to do me a favor and go to some of the, go ahead. This is an umbrella line where the protein. <laughs> Some of the tactics that we've seen the protesters using is using umbrellas to try and defend themselves against the less lethal, less lethal munitions that the fed, federal agents are using. And also we had a what's called a dad pod PDX show up with leaf blowers in order to try and blow the uh, tear gas and pepper gas uh, away from the protesters. After several days of this, the federal agents actually showed up with their leaf blowers. And we on a number of nights have seen the protesters on one side of the fence trying to blow the tear gas back away from the protesters and federal agents on the other side of the fence trying to blow the tear gas and pepper gas uh, back at the protesters. <laughs> Despite these violent tactics, we've continued to see a community uh, developing within the protesters, making them closer and closer together. This includes music, dancing, fire dancing, um, providing free food for one another, providing free medical assistance for one another. And so if anything, the, the federal tactics have brought the Portland community closer together. One of the main things that we've seen evolve here in Portland is different walls. We've seen walls of mothers, walls of social workers, walls of vets. We've seen that dad pod PDX. We have seen walls of lawyers. We have seen walls of chefs coming in their chef uniforms. We have seen um, walls of, um, gosh, I can't even remember them all. Um, unions, um, there's the wall of vets. And um, there are some nights when we've seen over 6,000 people gathering outside the federal courthouse and the Justice Center taking a stand both against racism in America as well as federal overreach by unleashing their troops. There's a picture of a wall, a wall of healthcare workers. In addition to standing against what the feds are doing and against racism, um, that some of these healthcare workers have been providing free medical services, as, as I stated, around the, the courthouse, particularly to protests that are injured by federal tactics. The federal tactics include releasing a number of gases, uh, including those that violate the Geneva Convention. The U.S. is one of the only democracies in the world that allows tear gas and um, these other chemical gases, some of which have not been identified uh, against its own citizens. In addition to that, you've seen a lot of creativity. This is a, um, a uh, projection on the front of the Justice Center, Multnomah County Justice Center. Um, the protesters frequently come up with new projections. The federal uh, uh, agents are often portrayed as stormtroopers, and in fact, um, the Star Wars theme song is often played when they come marching out. Um, you often have victims of police brutality also projected on the walls around the courthouse, and so the protesters continue to get more and more creative in how they uh, get their messages out there and keep the movement alive. Despite these tactics, um, the, the protesters continue to come out night after night, as I mentioned, and unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of creativity on the part of the federal agents. Um, you know, what we've seen overall, we have seen both sides trying to adapt to the other, um, but what we uh, have also yeah. seen... You know, there's another picture or video of, of how large the crowds have been getting. But as I was starting to say, you know, what, what we're continuing to see is that the feds, um, the federal agents are just using more and more gas and more and more non-lethal munitions to the point that many people are getting hurt. They're being shot in the head by these munitions and winding up in the hospital. Uh, several people have had their skulls fractured. Um, and, and so it's a very dangerous situation and, and we're afraid that someone will get killed. To 
me, I want you to take a look at that flashbang and how close it is to the videographer. That is Eddie, who is a, you know, just finished her junior year in high school and has been going up there night after night, often till four o'clock in the morning. And she has been repeatedly targeted by federal agents. They have regularly deployed flashbangs right near her, even though there's no one else other than her mom or her dad, I'm her mom, you know, or her dad, we, we switch off shadowing her to make sure that she's safe. And despite her, her age and being clearly marked as press and us shadowing her to try and protect her, there are seven, seven, seven instances in which she has been harmed by the agents. Um, we, we, at the beginning, I thought maybe these were incidental because it's a dangerous situation, but after reading other declarations and a case brought by the ACLU against the federal agents, it became clear to me that the federal agents were intentionally targeting uh, members of the press and that they were defending uh, their decision to target members of the press. And so I no longer can believe that it was uh, an act. And you can see her turning away when the flashbang goes off against her. In addition to that flashbang, there was another flashbang um, that was set off right next to her. It was, I grabbed it. It was clearly marked Vortac, which is the elite tactical unit of Border Patrol. And that, um, that, that Vortac grenade is the largest flashbang grenade that's made by Defense Technologies. And in fact, we read the manufacturer's instructions and it was not being used in accordance with the manufacturer, manufacturer's instructions. Um, in fact, we have repeatedly seen these, um, you know, the federal agents intentionally misusing the, um, the weapons that they brought. This is what Eddie looked like when they set off that Vortac uh, grenade right next to her. She was clearly marked as press. She had press in yellow reflective tape. She had added this because she had been targeted so many times that night. And, um, and this is what she looks like now. Eddie used the money that she was gonna use for her prom dress to buy a bulletproof vest instead. So that's, that's what you see there because there were so many people getting hurt and the federal agents started to bring assault rifles to um, the protests. And, um, and so she, again, increased even more her, her and her visibility, as well as her protection. That was the video of uh, the flashbang grenade that was dispatched by Vortec uh, targeting Eddie. I'm doing a lot of talking for her right now just because she has been kicked out and is trying to get back in. And so I apologize. This is supposed to be her presentation, not mine. But when I wasn't hearing her, her um, you know, I stepped in. Um, so she's trying to, to come back in while she is. I wonder if it makes sense, David, for us to switch back in. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the legal issues that, that we're seeing while she tries to get back into the panel? Yeah, I'll leave that to Team Bledsoe to sort of uh, maybe uh, suggest where we want to go, if that's OK. Sure, David. Thank you. Um, what I would, uh, the, the, the big issue is why the federal troops were there in the first place, right? And, and so I think that clearly Eddie's coverage uh, is for a large period of time. And so I, I'd like to, to ask both of you um, in terms of what you have seen and the stated explanation for the federal troops uh, being sent to Portland, being that there was a need to protect the federal building and the lives inside uh, and I guess politically what President Trump is saying is that uh, the local authorities weren't handling their business. Um, and so 
what, what's the real truth when you look at the facts and things that you all have seen about whether or not there was any legitimacy from the beginning in terms of assigning federal troops to Portland? David? Thank you. Uh, great to be with everybody. So the contrary to the portrayal in the press, um, the uh, protests and um, in, in some of the press, I should say the national press and particular, particular outlets and the president, the demonstrations were waning. They were, they were smaller crowds and I think Eddie can talk about this in more detail. But there certainly was a three, there's about a three square block radius of downtown, the Hatfield Courthouse, the federal courthouse built to withstand a terrorist attack, a stone building, has been heavily graffitied, and the Justice Center, a county jail, and a police building uh, a block away, or Jason, has also been heavily hit. Um, the federal facility, the, the damage was mostly graffiti, and certainly our local police, who are no angels themselves, were capable of managing these protests. The stated basis legally, you know, there's a legal and the political the legal theory was, well, you know, the feds have the authority to protect federal property. Well, I'm sure that's true as far as it goes, but of course, if you listen to any iteration of uh, the president, you hear that the city's been trashed, you know, the anarchists are running amok, Antifa, blah, 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 blah. None of that's true. My office is half a mile from the site. I walk down there all the time. The city's been affected by COVID. The city's had its economic struggles with houselessness. And, but the city is functioning just fine. And there's a very small area of dysfunction in about a three block radius. And really that's very, very late at night. The, the, the one thing I would say before kicking it back is you can really see something concrete that highlights a disparity between what they say and what they mean. And I grew up, I'm old enough, I grew up on that magazine. It was a regular feature, what they say, what they really mean. Well, what they say is we're there to attack the federal buildings. But there's extensive footage, extensive narrative, extensive experience where these agents and they're unnamed and unmasked or unmarked, are two, three, four, five blocks from the courthouse firing on people who were moving away. That's not protecting property. So. I, I can see the uh, very um, important point there. So what you're saying is that people who were no threat because they were even moving away from the area they're supposed to be protecting, that they actually pursued them and, 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 and fired at them when they presented no threat and whatever threat there had been, if there had been one, had been clearly eliminated. And, and so you're saying that they're really being very much proactive and, and aggressive and in other words, trying to, trying to, trying to make something happen. I think they're, they're very intentionally targeting people and they're going well beyond the limits of jurisdictional authority. The other thing that we see repeatedly is that they are literally gassing and firing on people with no warning, no declaration of a, of a riot. So there are people out there, peaceful protesters out in the park, presenting absolutely no threat whatsoever. And we have, we have multiple examples of this, and they're firing tear gas on people. Now, they don't like the message, Black Lives Matter, I guess, or they want to show that First Amendment rights don't matter either. But it's clearly in a classic setting where they are simply going to do what they want to do to stifle dissent. And Portland has a long history of protest of dissent. It's sort of baked into the DNA of this odd city. Um, they, they take the hornet's nest. So, uh, uh Eddie, you're really uh, courageous, and uh, we really have to take our hats off to you. And I think you were doing a, a number of things, and maybe wearing more than one hat when you were out there, besides being a concerned citizen representing the National Lawyers Guild, 
and then actually being a media person for your school newspaper. And uh, uh, I want to get into uh, a whole discussion about what your, uh, what your video, what your observations have shown in reference to that whole issue about whether or not federal troops were needed. But I'd, I'd like to first start out by talking about what happened to you in terms of you're there, uh, you're complying with the rules, you're doing what someone in your position should do, and all of a sudden you're attacked and what I'm gathering from four feet away. And I saw the photos that you, you provided in your declaration because you're one of the persons as a plaintiff in one of the cases. Uh, and it seems like you had a really serious uh, wound that next day as a result of uh, uh, the projectile that, that hit you when the grenade was sent. So could you tell us what, uh, what happened there and, and what was going through your mind and, and what, what you were doing and, 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 and so we can see clearly uh, that, that uh, whether there was any basis at all and it seems like there was no basis at all for anyone to come anywhere near you, but they did. So those were two separate incidents. The wound was another day. That was actually my mom's cuts um, because there, for that incident, there had been a fire that was started in the portico mm -hmm. and I had gone up to look at it and my mom was standing like out on the sidewalk far over by the curb and officers came running out. And so I go up along the wall. I have my hands out up. I'm clearly marked as press. I'm trying to move out of their way and they go out of their way to shove me into the wall, my mom into the ground, and a number of other protesters into the ground, even though people were trying to move out of their way, people were not trying to interfere with them putting out the fire. And despite both me and my mom being clearly marked as press, um, they shoved both of us. So she was the one who got all those cuts from that because she was shoved to the ground. Um, and I was just shoved into a wall. Um, uh, but then we've had several flashbangs, stun grenades thrown at us, including the one in those, the ones in those videos. And those are deafening. They hurt your ears. You can hardly hear afterwards. Um, they're temporarily blinding and they're scary. I mean, one of the, flash grenades that were stun grenades that was thrown at us it was the sh the most um it's the strongest stun grenade that defense technology makes and it was thrown right near us while we were standing in the park away from protesters and then they are just kind of throwing them indiscriminately and then another instance where it seems that uh, in this case, it seems like they were targeting media. Uh, we, uh, I was standing with the press corps. So there were about half a dozen members of the press standing off to the side of the police line and protesters were out there facing the police line. And there was an officer that turned his munitions gun and pointed it right at the press corps despite there being no protesters near us. And then another officer comes over, tells him that's media, don't shoot. He, the first officer then turns his munitions gun away towards the protesters and then proceeds to turn it back and point it right at me. So we're seeing time and time again that journalists are being targeted or there are coming that they're being threatened and hurt because of negligence on the part of officers and 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 you're saying negligence and it may very well be negligence but did you see any behavior where it seemed as though they knew what they were doing where they were close to you uh when yes. You targeted yes so i think different I think there are different motivations behind different incident incidents that um, we've seen and that I've experienced uh, I don't necessarily think one of the instances where they threw a stun grenade 
they kind of just lobbed it over a wall and it was near us and there was no one near us but i don't think I don't think that was targeting us. I think that was negligence on the part of the officers because they didn't really check their line of sight or anything before throwing that stun grenade. So I think that there are instances of extreme negligence that could result in serious injury. And then we're, we're also seeing that they are targeting journalists, like with the munitions gun. And, and with the uh, munitions gun, could you explain how, how close were they when that happened? Oh, they were, the guy was probably, the officer was probably, what, 15 feet away? Is that right? Yeah. And luckily he didn't shoot or anything, but why he would feel the need to point the gun at the press and then after being told not to turn it back, and pointed at us again, uh, clearly shows that he has some sort of issue with the press. Yeah. And, 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 and were you afraid during any of this time? Oh yeah, it's, it's a really, it is scary down there. Um, it's a very dynamic and dangerous situation. And we're seeing people get seriously injured. Uh, and I think that if it were to continue the way that it's been continuing, I think that someone could end up with an injury that results in their death. Um, because, yeah, because of how the officers are using the weapons, often ignoring the guidelines and the rules for how to use them. And we're seeing that that's extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, we're seeing people with skull fractures, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, the, uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm gathering from, from, from you is that your fears and concerns that you had were not fears of the protesters and whatever they were doing, that the fears that you had were you were fearful of what the federal officers might do. Yes. I think that most of the protesters' actions are not to cause serious harm. Um, I think there is a handful of agitators who do want to cause harm to officers they're shining lasers in officers' eyes. Although, to counter that, officers are also using lasers to indicate protesters, like where other officers should fire. So that's, that goes both ways. Yeah. Now, uh, 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 I think you raised some really uh, significant questions in terms of uh, the actual use of the equipment that was being used allegedly for crowd control. And Warren, I know you've got some specific thoughts. You, you went into those a, a bit earlier, uh, but maybe you could go more into uh, the types of, um, of items that they're using, whether it's grenades or rubber bullets or what have you. And I think you told us yesterday there was even a, a, a person who was wearing a helmet that you talk with that one of those bullets hit the helmet and actually fractured the skull. And so even these, these devices are so, they may not be your traditional type weapons or what have you, but they may actually uh, uh, cause harm even if you're wearing a protective gear like a helmet. Uh, and I see, um, so would you kind of explain to us the seriousness of what's actually being done in terms of the actual methods of crowd control that are being used and how they're dangerous to the public? Yeah. So the main um, methods of crowd control that we're seeing are uh, different types of chemical gas canisters and smoke. And what will happen is that when the feds come out, sometimes they come out with provocation. Like Eddie was saying, sometimes people will be throwing things at the courthouse. Sometimes people will be yelling at the officers. Sometimes they might be um, tagging the walls of the courthouse. Sometimes they might start um, small fires. Keep in mind that this courthouse is stone and marble, that this is a fortress. This courthouse is a gorgeous 
fortress that will last forever. You know, it will out outlast all of us. Um, it's not going to catch on fire, but it absolutely, in my mind, is wrong for people to be tagging it, to be starting these small fires, et cetera. They shouldn't be doing those things. They should not be throwing things at the officers. They throw things like donuts. They throw things like, um, uh, you know, cans, water bottles, et cetera. They shouldn't be doing that. The appropriate response to those types of activities is to identify those people who are engaged in criminal activity, to arrest them, and to prosecute them if that's what the prosecutor decides to do. Instead, what's happening is that the federal agents are storming out of the building and they are in, at times without discrimination, shooting off all of these canisters in all directions, regardless of whether the person is peaceful, an agitator, a member of the press or a legal observer. And then they are spraying the crowd with uh, less lethal munitions. We have seen pepper balls used, um, I believe rubber bullets and um, paintballs and anything else, Eddie, that we've seen other than those munitions? Uh, I don't think so. And then yeah, have you talked about the gas that they're using? Why don't you talk about the gas in the Geneva Convention? So they're also using tear gas. We're seeing them use pepper spray extensively now. Uh, because protesters have, almost all the protesters have gas masks now, and so the tear gas isn't as effective, and so we're seeing officers use pepper spray in a canister form, we're seeing officers use pepper spray in the, like, spray, um, and that, the use of that has heightened drastically, even over the last several days. Uh, and then, and the thing with those types of, the things with the gases is that that is completely indiscriminate. You have a big homeless population in the park across from the courthouse. You have a bunch, a lot of medical tents are set up in the park across from the courthouse. There are tents that are providing food in the park across from the courthouse. And all of those people that are providing services or who are dealing with homelessness are both getting, are both feeling the effects of this gas because they're gassing so heavily and so indiscriminately that it's filling all of the squares. And then we're even seeing the Justice Center houses the jail and the Justice Center is right next to the courthouse. And we're seeing reports that the people being held in the jail in the justice center are getting the tear gas and the tear gas is coming into their cells and we're seeing that they're having to press the panic button because they can't breathe because the tear gas is so heavy. So we're seeing all of these people caught in the crossfire of this use of gas and tear gas is banned under the Geneva Convention. We do not use it in times of war or anything like that. And we are also only one of two democracies that uses tear gas on our own citizens. So it's us and France. Now, as far as- So let, let me, uh, I think that, uh, were you gonna add something more? Yeah, I was gonna add two things. One is the targeting of certain protesters. So. You know, you had asked about helmets, and um, one of the things that concerns me is that at night, um, it there is a um, large number of white people out there, including the agitators, and there are some black people there, but in my observation, I know at least a couple of black people who have been shot in the head by the federal agents and, um, and have been injured. And that really concerns me because on the one hand, it, it seems like they are spraying the crowd with these non-lethal um, munitions, but at the same time, less lethal munitions, but at the same time, the fact that black people continue to be uh, hit in their head at a, what appears to be you know, casually at a disproportionate rate is deeply concerning to me. In addition to my fear that they might be targeting certain peaceful protesters who happen to be black, Eddie watched as one agent pointed at two protesters and then the person next to him shot a, uh, a canister, it was a flashbang grenade, right at the feet of these protesters. 
despite the fact that the canister that we have that they deployed towards Eddie clearly says that you need to shoot this only in areas that have been cleared of people and where everybody is wearing both eye and ear protection. So they're not following the manufacturer's instructions, like she said. But in addition to that, you know, she's a, a witnessed at least one occasion where two pro peaceful protesters have been, apparently peaceful protesters have been pointed out and then it was deployed in a way that was intentionally harmful towards them. So one, what, what you're actually uh, uh, saying is quite uh, interesting there and in that what you're saying is that from what you have seen, uh, there appears to be a clear targeting by officials of African-Americans in the crowd because what I'm gathering is because of the, the population of Portland, among other issues, the, the percentage of African-Americans in, the, uh, in these crowds have been very low. Is that right? That's my fear. You know, and I, again, you know, these are, that's a casual observation. I don't have the numbers, but just the fact that I have repeatedly seen you know, African Americans and other people of color who have been hidden in the head. And I've seen the population of this crowd and it is overwhelmingly white. And it's like, how is it that these are the people who are getting hit? You know, in the press uh, as well. David, I'd like to uh, maybe ask you, uh, I know we want to talk about some of the legal issues that are involved. And I know that I think from what you had indicated yesterday, there are at least four suits that you're aware of that have been filed. I know Eddie's part of uh, uh, one of the suits. And so could you kind of give us um, kind of uh, a description of the uh, types of litigation that have been brought and kind of give us a kind of a thumbnail sketch of what you think the, uh, the constitutional and statutory issues are that have been raised by what, uh, what we've been discussing today? Hopefully I don't put anybody to sleep. Uh, but uh, just briefly, most of the cases that have already been filed are for injunctive relief. And the state of Oregon brought one uh, purporting to be on behalf of all citizens of the state of Oregon. Um, the case has been dismissed for lack of Article Three standing. The ACLU filed a targeted, uh, careful injunctive relief case um, protecting prohibiting targeting of medics and press. And I think Eddie is a plaintiff in that, if I'm not mistaken, or has participated as the declarant. Uh, that was in front of Judge Simon and uh, in, here in Portland, and he issued a TRO, and now there's a show cause for violating that because they kept doing it. Um, an interesting, really interesting suit for those kind of in the legal geekery uh, world has been brought by an awesome nonprofit advocacy group, Western State Center. It's headquartered here in Portland and fabulous anti-racism work. Um, and uh, the Unitarian Church and a couple of observers. And in that case, um, they are alleging, they're seeking injunctive relief for violation of the 10th Amendment, essentially, because, you know, the idea that the feds can send forces to protect federal property, I don't think anybody disputes. But once you start leaving the building or once you're purporting to police outside of the building within the confines of the local jurisdiction, then you get into all sorts of interesting 10th Amendment issues. And they're seeking an injunction. I believe they're filing their TRO. They filed their TRO or they're about to file their TRO, but temporary restraining orders. And then uh, I am part of a team that is putting together a mass of uh, individual claims for peaceful protesters who have been harmed. It'll essentially be uh, 1983 Bivens type claims for those who do civil rights work and also common law tort to the extent those, those are in play. What's interesting again is that these uh, protester situations implicate all sorts of different constitutional rights. We've touched briefly on the 10th Amendment, we've touched briefly on the First Amendment. There are a number of detainment cases without probable cause, and in fact, the feds have practically admitted it by saying publicly things like, yeah, that guy was standing next to somebody who was suspicious, so we, we grabbed him. Okay, well, last I checked, and I'm not a criminal law 
a procedure person, but last I checked, that's kind of the antithesis of probable cause. Probable cause would be the guy who did something, not the person standing next to the guy who you thought did something. Uh, so there are arrest cases, uh, false arrest cases. Uh, there are excessive force cases, of course. Um, there's certainly Eddie's videos, a lot of descriptions, a lot of the folks we've talked to, a lot of the news accounts have, you know, pretty clearly make a showing of deliberate indifference and reckless disregard, which are buzzwords and standards that operate in you know, the 1983 realm. Um, the last thing I want to kind of touch briefly is, um, you know, we've gotten some feedback or some pushback. And people ask, well, you know, aren't you, aren't you sort of feeding the Trumps? Uh, he's really good with media. He's re they're going to distort this, right? They're going to, they're going to, don't, don't y'all, don't y'all think you should, you should sit quiet a little bit. Um, and I will tell you that our city's been invaded by the feds, right? And I, I certainly didn't plan, wake up one morning and decide, I know, let me find, file a cluster of civil rights suits. And I know my colleagues at ACLU weren't planning, didn't have a plan to file injunction cases to protect people like Eddie and medics who were out on the scene. But, but we can't really sit back and let that happen. Right? Resistance and, and pushback are essential if you're fighting this kind of darkness. And the fact that they may use this for their propaganda is just one of those things. Well, it would seem to me, David, let me just make a comment there. It would seem to me that the facts will come out more so in litigation that you're probably doing a public service by bringing the actions because uh, when you have one side saying one thing and another saying a different thing, uh, when you start getting people under oath or what have you or uh, bringing forth information in a different context, it seems to me like the truth has a real possibility of coming out. So. So I would think that would be the contrary position in terms of whether or not uh, President Trump or anyone is able to manipulate this and demagogue this and make this into a, a 1968 Democratic convention, which is, I think, what, what's actually being attempted in some ways here. So, but, but, but one of the questions I would have as well, I think we might all have interest in, in case this kind of goes around the, the country, uh, is that there's the issue of the legality of all these different agencies. I know, I know Warren talked about how she's fought the border patrol and it was so ironic then to see the border patrol come and start harming a member of her family, right? And so they got all these amalgamation of unknown agencies or what have you, and they're there. Is, is that kind of an issue in the claims that you're going to be bringing? And, and what is kind of the rule, the way you would understand it about when there's a legitimate uh, right to actually bring in uh, federal troops and what they must do. Well, I, we're, we're certainly not only looking at that, but we're also looking at delegation. And we have good reason to believe that a lot of these uh, anonymous agents are in fact contractors and mercenary. So we're, we're going to be breaking down as we get into discovery because it has not been transparent at all exactly which agency invoking what authority is doing all of these things. And I'm going to guess, knowing our adversaries, if they didn't quite think this through and do it by the book, what exactly that's going to look like is going to be an open question because we, we need to do our discovery to figure out, you know, who was deployed under what authority, under what authority do you claim Right, for example, to declare this a riot, right? And under what power and authority do you declare that the feds have that uh, ability to declare that locally and also respond, right? And what was delegated to you and what could have been delegated to you? And, and the state and government and the local government have been pushing back and saying, we don't want you here. In other words, it's not as if the, the mayor of Portland said, purported to delegate or call in. And the governor has been very outspoken. So I have not done, our team has not done any discovery. We don't know enough yet to know, but I, I'm really interested to see how that plays out. I, I suspect that uh, Professor Benford may have some thoughts about that as well, because I know she's had to look at this within her, her advocacy work in immigration. 
Yeah. So let me, what I want to say is that um, on the one level, there is the concern that you have ICE agents and Border Patrol agents who are marching through the streets of Portland and, um, and harming uh, U.S. citizens. Um, in addition to that, you know, we have heard and I have um, interviewed at least one young man who was walking down the street, walking down the sidewalk in downtown Portland uh, three nights ago, four nights ago now, and uh, a federal patrol or federal protective service car drove by. He lifted his hand, flipped off the officers, and they then pulled over in front of him, uh, you know, uh, bound his hands and his feet, throw him in the back of that car, and then drove him to an undisclosed location, would not tell him who they were, why he was being arrested, um, or apprehended, I should say, and whether or not he was being charged. They held him all night long. They did not give him any water to drink for hours and hours, despite the fact that, you know, there was all sorts of gases in the air, as there are every night um, in downtown Portland these days. And, um, and, and eventually, he was told that he was picked up by Border Patrol. U.S. citizen, white skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, did nothing wrong except for flip off the officers, which we all know is his right to do. Should he do it? Is it distasteful? Of course it's distasteful. But not only does he have a right to do that, but they have a sworn duty to defend his right to flip them off. It's not grounds for arresting someone. And in fact, when the next morning he insisted that he be able to talk to his attorney, they released him and told him that he, he wasn't being charged. And, and so, you know, we, we have this behavior by these agents who have been sent here that are a violation of the oath that they've taken when they entered into government service and they're a violation of their duties to the citizenry. In addition to that, the stated purpose of the administration sending these uh, agents into the streets of Portland was that they were going to quell the protests. In fact, they have done exactly the opposite of their stated mission. They have increased the number of participants from about 100 uh, late at night every night to we have seen over 6,000 people in the streets now in response. And then they've used the tactics that Mike showed again and again with some of Eddie's video footage, which is that they have consistently used this shock and awe campaign. And when more people show up the next day, rather than try a different tactic, what they do instead is release even more gas and even more harmful gases so that the last few times that we've been out there in the last week, we have had what appears to be an oil based um, pepper gas. Somebody asked in the chat whether or not we think that they're mixing um, you know, different chemicals. We honestly don't know what they're mixing, but what I do know is that um, now my skin is burning long after I um, am, you know, am, am exposed to this gas that when we've tried to wipe it off with milk or water, it gets worse, not better. And that the next day when I tried to wash it off in the shower, it left my body and my face stinging. So there clearly are, you know, more harmful, uh, you know, chemicals, irritants that they're using against the protesters and against the press. And I think that they're doing it intentionally. So, you know, the, the two takeaways from what I'm trying to say is that they are clearly openly violating people's constitutional rights for freedom of speech, for freedom of assembly, for freedom of the press. But in addition to that, they are failing in their mission, regardless of who these people are or whether or not they should be here. You know, the, the documents have been leaked that show that they are not trained in crowd control. And even if those documents had not been linked from the Department of Homeland Security, their very actions show that these people are not trained in crowd control and they're making the situation worse, not better. Uh, I'm just going to jump in because we have some questions. Uh, now, that protester who was arrested, who you interviewed, uh, Professor Benford, he basically was saying that the Border Patrol was number one, and, and they that's when they arrested him? That the Border Patrol what? Was number one. He was he was showing that they were number one. Oh, I didn't, sorry, I didn't know what that meant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he didn't know they were Border Patrol. He just saw that it was Federal Protective Service, a Federal Protective Service vehicle, so while it was driving by you know, he flipped them off and, and, you know, and they pulled over in front of him and they didn't arrest him, but they apprehended him and threw him in jail and then never charged him and told him before he was released when he demanded to know who it was who had apprehended him, uh, he, they informed him that it had been Border Patrol. 
Well, and that's why I thought this was so appropriate. I remembered this from the court. It's, it really is a beautiful courthouse, but there, it's engraved right in the front door. The boisterous sea of liberty is never without a wave, which is pretty appropriate when you're talking about someone expressing uh, his or her right to have an opinion. Uh, and this is just some photos, I guess, of what the park up there. It really is a beautiful courthouse. Uh, it's a beautiful area. Uh, one of the questions that, that I think has been unanswered, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out, is if in this case, and, and I think, you, you know, David touched on this a little bit, not that people shouldn't fight back because that needs to happen, but, but what's the concern about this being able to be used, capitalized, because obviously Trump and the folks supporting him, including an SMU grad, I don't think it's a coincidence for those of y'all, I'm sorry if you went to SMU, uh, Chad Wolf, our Homeland Security, but, you know, is this something where this is playing into their hands and sense, and, and obviously you still got to fight, but, but what's the concern about this being used to at least get folks who think it's okay to do this kind of conduct in a political way down the road? Well, I, I think it's clearly political theater and, and then some, um, I think it's political theater and also, and also testing and also dress rehearsal um, and also a little bit of um, tiny male part being um, trying to, try to make up for tiny male parts. Um, I don't feel like those of us, in, and especially, I imagine what most of the folks who have been on the front lines would say, perhaps a little less, with a little less words. I don't believe that we can steer by that. The fact that they, they will misuse everything and their propaganda will do and will find and I'm sure part of the reason that they cut a deal with the governor and, and supposedly are withdrawing, uh, which we haven't really talked about, it may well have been a campaign telling them, we've milked this, it's time to go home uh, because you're at risk for this kind of problem. So all of that is true. This, this can be misused. It will be part of their campaign. It will be part of their propaganda. But I can't, I can't give much weight to that, frankly, given where we are. So the next question has is uh, probably more for Eddie, I think, and that is, you know, and, and I know Professor Benford touched on this. Obviously, there are there are, not everybody is an angel. Not every person out there at the park is doing what they should. In terms of kind of the the scope and scale, what have you seen about? kind of the bad behavior by protesters and how much of that is is legitimate concerns by federal officers who are concerned about their safety, the safety of their fellow officers, the safety of the building versus the reactions and the conduct you've seen? So, I mean, there is a small group of agitators who come out late at night. Um, you're seeing in the early evening, you're seeing these massive protests that are completely peaceful. Um, and those are, that happens like every, every early evening. And then the crowd begins to dwindle down to hundreds from thousands. And then you'll, you'll, see, you'll see a small group of agitators who want to engage with federal officers. They want to get federal officers to come out of the building all of that. So we're seeing people trying to light the plywood on the front of the building on fire in on the front of the, the stone courthouse, which doesn't like there there isn't really a legitimate concern that that's going to catch on fire because it is a stone courthouse. Um, so that's not, I mean, obviously fire arson is bad, but it doesn't, there isn't a legitimate concern that something serious is going to happen to federal property because of these fires. Um, and they're just like little fires. Usually other protesters put them out pretty quickly. Um, we're seeing a lot of fireworks shot towards the building. There have been professional grade fireworks. 
Um, there are a lot of the Roman candle ones too. We are seeing two nights we saw people break through the plywood and attempt to smash the bulletproof glass underneath. Uh, and then we've seen people, uh, when the reinforced fence is up around the courthouse, that's come a lot of people, that's come under a lot of contention. Um, and we've seen protesters time and time again trying to pull the fence down. We've seen them dismantle the fence on several occasions and use it to barricade the front doors of the courthouse. Uh, we are seeing, yeah, so there's a lot with the fence. There are a lot of people that are climbing over the fence. And when officers do come out, we're seeing them, we're seeing protesters throw things at them. It ranges in severity. Um, I mean, I haven't seen any rocks, but DHS is saying that rocks have been thrown we've also but we've also seen things like empty water bottles being thrown and things like that so it kind of ranges in severity from water bottles and bouncy balls to rocks and fireworks and so there is there are there are agitators and there are are people that want to provoke a response but in a lot of these instances, it would be very, it wouldn't be that hard to pick the agitators out of the crowd, especially if they're coming over the fence, um, because you're only having a handful of people coming over the fence, starting fires, shooting off fireworks, um, now that the fence is up. And so it, it isn't that hard to come out and take them into custody or something like that. So what we've seen is we haven't seen anything that warrants the extreme response that we are seeing from federal officers. Thank you, Eddie. And, and I'm going to go ahead and before I turn it over to, to Dean Bledsoe to kind of wrap it up. Thank you all very much. We've had a great crowd and great comments and so many people are inspired by what you're doing in particular, Eddie, uh, down there. And I actually do have one question. I mean, obviously you didn't plan that your prom dress would end up as a bulletproof vest. Uh, but as a practical matter, or, or maybe, you know, it's obviously been interesting. Has any part of it just been plain fun doing what you're doing out there? It's been, I mean, it's been really cool to see these massive, massive protests during the early evening. Um, one of my favorite memories is they, several nights, um, all there's been some music or something and all the protesters have turned on their flashlights and raised their flash their phones and done oh. the whole like concert wave thing and that was Eddie, I apologize, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm very sorry. I really, we're not hearing you very well at all. Um, and I think just, it's a, I apologize, but it, it's really got, yeah, we can't hear you. I apologize, Eddie. I'm going to, we lost you, Eddie, pretty much in terms of the audio. Let me go ahead if, if I can. Harold, can you go ahead and mute Eddie? Yeah. And so can close. Yeah. Thanks. So thank you, Dean Bledsoe, for. Oops. I think I think you're good now, Dean Bledsoe. Thank you very much for for leading this discussion. Well. <laughs> 
Well, it looks like I can't even get to her on the Yalco. She's gone now. All right. Thank you very much for, for leaving this panel. That's that's an interesting way to end. We've actually been very lucky. Uh, well, you know, it's going to happen. But uh, I apologize, everybody, for the technical issues. But but can you go ahead, please, Dean Bledsoe, and wrap it? We started a little late, so this is a great time for wrapping it. And thank you very much for, for David and, and Eddie and, and Warren and, and Dean Bledsoe for being here, from all the members and the folks that attended. We've got great comments and great attendance. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, Dean, we've lost you now. Wait, you're on mute. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, for participating. I think we have had a, a tremendous panel. I think that the panel is so timely in so many uh, ways because I think that some of the questions that were raised in the chat in reference to uh, whether Portland can be used in an inappropriate way in a campaign to actually change the dynamics of what's actually occurring I think that the fact that you all are there and providing this truthful information uh, from the inside and that uh, with the great reporting that Eddie has done uh, where you can see it uh, right there and the fact that Warren was there uh, uh, with her on a number of occasions and can actually say uh, there was no threat. We were wearing press credentials. Uh, we uh, were clearly targeted in some instances directly. Other times it might have been negligence. Uh, and I think what's also really important for all of us to note, and so when these issues come up, we can discuss them, is that there was no real basis for the federal troops to come in. I think what we've heard is that from those who are there on site, uh, and what uh, Eddie's uh, uh, reporting will actually show, is that matters were under control at the time, uh, that there was no legitimate basis to bring in uh, federal troops. And we've seen the real a horrifying example of what's actually done when people are brought in to do something they're not really trained to do. Uh, when they're brought in from uh, being border patrol agents or some other types of agents, uh, not uh, trained to have the kinds of encounters with individuals where they're actually acting in a predatory fashion, not in a protective fashion. And they're actually going after individuals with, an, uh, with a mind towards actually creating an incident is what I understand and I gather from what they have said here. So I think those kinds of stories need to be told and made very clear uh, to the American public because I think the American public should understand the real danger. It, it only comes to my mind how fearful it must be when somebody comes up to me in some kind of fatigues without proper markings and grabs me and ushers me to somewhere in an unmarked car. I don't know who they are. I don't know that they're not members of some hate group uh, that has come out and decided to join in the activity. Uh, so this is really reprehensible conduct, uh, and I'm so glad that they're already on top of it, and you can see the change in technology and how it's changing the balance. And so uh, thank you, uh, Eddie. Your uh, work is going to make for uh, real historical changes here, and your courage, and, 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 and Warren, you have to be very proud uh, of raising that, uh, that young lady. And David, thank you for your great litigation. Looking forward to more. I know a lot of folks are really excited to see what you might do in a products liability uh, arena. And even looking at the whole issue that's part of the George Floyd uh, uh, a murder discussion about qualified immunity and individual officers and whether or not you'll be able to have uh, any success, whether you'll even go down those roads. So I think that'll be important to do. And please keep us informed. And I think that uh, what uh, Steve and Mike have indicated is that some of the footage and information uh, that we'll see uh, from Eddie's coverage, uh, there might be a link provided uh, on HCDLA website where you can get more information and stay up to date. And we have to say that uh, uh, thanks for doing this and our hats are off to you and whatever support we can give you here in Texas, uh, definitely we'd want to do that. And thank you guys for taking your time to be part of this uh, event. And so let me turn it back uh, over to Mike uh, and uh, just to, to, to say goodbye, but thanks for everyone for participating. This has been a very valuable discussion. Thank you, thank you, Dean. So three things I'm gonna leave you with as we close. One is August 12th, we have Professor Robinson, the only Native American Studies law professor at University of Oklahoma commenting on the, or discussing rather, a really pivotal, uh, pivotal case involving the uh, Cree Indians where it reaffirmed that, that treaties mean something and it's really something that's going to have a massive impact on Western states potentially 
and uh, we'll see him on October, August 12th. Uh, likewise, this will be available on our Facebook page of the recording. The chat function, I already loaded on there. That has the, the videos that Professor Benford had actually extracted. So anybody, if you want to learn more about it, it's going to be available there as well. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you next on August 12th. And thank you again to our panel. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys.